Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. to this compelling uh, program, Views on uh, the Continent. As we to the uh, analyze uh, uh, the uh, question, uh, is multilateralism the solution to Western uh, hegemony? Of course, uh, we are talking about uh, this very important uh, issue with a very illustrious uh, uh, panel of experts uh, that will shed light or bring more insight into this critical issue during uh, this uh, discursive uh, program that seeks, of course, to analyze uh, the uh, uh, impediment of Western uh, uh, hegemony and how this has helped to to entangle the world, uh, uh, according to the, some pundits, uh, with uh, the uh, U.S. dominated hegemony or Western hegemony, the global world has been entangled in the web. But then, uh, pundits have come with new perspective of international relations, and of course, with uh, the uh, developments that have occurred in the global world, to propose the ideology, of course, uh, the philosophy of multilateralism as the solution uh, to uh, putting an end to this uh, Western hegemony, Western dominance, and of course, it is views on the continent and informative, and as well as uh, uh, a discursive uh, program uh, and interactive as well as we come here to analyze this very important topic. And of course, we are apologizing for uh, the let's start, but then uh, we will go ahead uh, to analyzing, uh, of course, what is important. And we are looking at uh, these uh, illegalities of Western system and how it kills uh, the global perspective in terms of economy, in terms of financial markets, currency, among others. Thus, uh, of course, we're going straight away to uncover this panel. And it's with pleasure that I will introduce to you uh, Yulia Burke, who is joining us live to bring this uh, uh, insightful uh, discussion to a topic that's the, uh, is multilateralism, the solution to Western hegemony. Hello to you, Yulia, and you're joining uh, in your capacity as a political scientist. You are most welcome. Hello, yes, um, a political scientist and an applied specialist who's always on the go, which is reflected in, in the current situation as well. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for choosing this very important topic to focus on today. Of utmost importance, of course, uh, to discuss uh, things that have actually brought a uh, uh, crisis across the world. Because, according to some pundits, uh, the fact uh, that uh, the world has been controlled over the years or for many decades uh, by the US led uh, Western hegemony has brought about many crises. And in its uh, unilateral system, crises have been uh, uh, occurring across the global globe, but with the change changes in the sphere of international relations, there is need uh, uh, to brainstorm and to see the alternatives to this unilateral world or system that can actually uh, unify uh, uh, nations across uh, uh, different cultures, across different ideas, as we today analyze uh, this very important topic. Let's also acknowledge the presence of uh, Anna Devley, who is joining in his capacity as a political consultant uh, to give his insight on uh, this uh, very important topic. You're most welcome to the program, dear Arnold. Hello, Clarice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone and uh, to Julia Berg. Happy to be here. Okay, thank you for respecting uh, this uh, rendezvous this day. I will write off with you, uh, dear Arnold. We are talking about uh, the uh, irregular or illegal, illegal, uh, illegalities, I beg your pardon, of uh, U.S. Uh, Western uh, 
hegemony and of course today we are proposing multilateralism as a solution to this. Uh, first of all, uh, before uh, uh, analyzing the practicality of multilateralism in stopping uh, or silencing Western hegemony, let's try to understand the concept of this uh, Western hegemony, uh, which of course have had a grave effect on the uh, global world because when, when you look at uh, from uh, uh, statistics, there are still people who are not very conversant with how this Western uh, hegemony works and its graph effect on the, the global uh, economy. So can we understand holistically this ideology and see how uh, we can, in today's perspective, change uh, the narratives? Well, it's uh, pretty simple at the same time as it is uh, quite comprehensive as a system. To be sure, uh, everything is created on might. Might makes right. And so, unless the uh, is uh, brought to its knees in a way, uh, owing to the uh, multilateral approach that uh, other um, countries from the global south, but also uh, outside the uh, Western realm, as it were, uh, come together and accomplish this, uh, it will be difficult to convince uh, the West to abandon uh, what it has gotten used to. We almost are uh, dealing with a drug addict, uh, addicted to power. And uh, it's been 500 years now. And uh, suddenly, uh, all the best led plans, so to speak, are uh, somewhat crashing down, and it's uh, something that we can see now more than ever before, owing to uh, what, by all accounts, appear to be objective uh, uh, terms of reality, of perceptions, which would, in any other uh, context, circumstances, lead uh, the, uh, as it were here, the Western uh, uh, decision makers to account for a new reality and uh, um, take control of uh, the situation before it gets out of control for them so as to somewhat uh, um, salvage you know something uh, and in fact what we're seeing is a kind of doubling down approach uh, an escalation and so this is the problematic right now is uh, in order to deal with more multilateralism we need to uh, start from the premise that every participant to this process uh, respect each other and uh, starts on an equal footing. Uh, unfortunately, with the West, it's it's always been something that is somewhat uh, placarded, uh, you know, as part of their sets of values. But uh, in effect, it's never been uh, the way they perceive it. It's uh, do as I say, but uh, don't do as I do, in other words. Tifa, and thank you for that. Uh, let's continue in the same uh, uh, perspective uh, with uh, Yulia, uh, trying to understand uh, the rhetoric behind Western hegemony, and of course how uh, things can turn a new, uh, take a new uh, dimension in uh, this uh, uh, world uh, that is more, uh, of course, uh, a world of uh, multipolarism. And of course, uh, Yulia, what do you have to say regarding the the Western hegemony? Uh, uh, that has been controlling the world over the years and of course uh, uh, th this new perspective what uh, how can we understand the rhetoric behind uh, this uh, uh, ideology of uh, western dominance um well you see uh, there is a very simple formula to this and it says that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so you can never expect a, a, a hegemony or a power being held in one hand to be just and fair for all of the um, people that are being affected by it, right? So um, that's the key issue. And uh, the power has been held uh, in one uh, pair of hands for quite a while by now. And um, it's uh, getting more and more clear to many people out there, not just experts, uh, not just, uh, let's say, political scientists or uh, lawyers or, um, you know, journalists, but it's getting uh, quite clear to a lot of people that this system uh, is transforming. It's just uh, doomed to uh, transform 
and we can see the growing interest in alternative alliances and uh, uh, in just um, around a month there will be the uh, BRICS summit held it's one of those uh, uh, clear examples of uh, multilateral organizations and a lot of countries have shown interest I just read this article today saying that 41 country is ready to uh, is ready to work uh, with BRICS somehow either by joining or by using some of the uh, financial tools and mechanisms being offered in order to avoid uh, the necessity to trade via uh, uh, US dollars right so credibility to the uh, existing uh, system where the military power uh, the uh, opportunities uh, uh, for uh, using violence without uh, getting any, any um, negative consequences and the control of trade, the, the control of financial market, the control of investment, the control of, uh, um, the, the control of distribution of resources uh, is being held uh, pretty much uh, by the uh, global elites uh, centered and focused and seated, um, seated um, in uh, the United States. So uh, we can see many factors showing that uh, this system is ceasing to exist, while new partnerships uh, and new uh, types of relationships are um, coming in. So of course, very imperative, uh, dear Yulia. You quite uh, mentioned uh, BRICS because when we look at uh, the, uh, the the unipolar system and of course uh, the Western hegemony system, uh, we begin to ask uh, if there is, uh, of course, uh, already uh, a very strong institution or that can actually bring uh, an alternative, especially financial system or uh, payment uh, that will help uh, to uh, bring respite uh, to the world, knowing uh, that uh, uh, the, the U.S. actually is the dominating uh, currency in contemporary, but of course, like we said, as there are already uh, changes now, uh, uh, the, the dominance of Western uh, uh, past has uh, been a global uh, issue. We are conversant of that uh, for, for decades now, but then uh, our focus for today is the aspect of multilateralism being a solution to this Western hegemony. So in your perspective, uh, uh, dear Yulia, I continue with you. How can you think multilateralism can challenge this uh, uh, hegemony and, of course, foster a, a more balanced uh, uh, global order? Um, well, I would say that uh, when you have uh, when you have a system uh, which implies uh, uh, which implies having different options, when you can uh, uh, choose partnerships that would be uh, mutually beneficial, when you can when you can uh, negotiate the deals when uh, uh, no one is uh, making you forcefully either um, would there would there be the uh, hard uh, let's say uh, force applied or the soft uh, force. Um, applied uh, when no one is making you um, pick an option that is not uh, benefiting you uh, when you have um, again different uh, regional blocks when you have uh, different offers at the table and you're able to negotiate you're able to uh, decide on your own when you have that sovereignty that is uh, clearly necessary to make that kind of decisions it changes um, it changes the game a lot right so I think that key is uh, uh, finding that dynamic balance between the different actors, considering the circumstances that uh, they're going through, their strengths uh, and weaknesses and what they have to offer. And another important thing to it is that uh, uh, this uh, over-focused um, system has created a bubble that is pretty much empty inside, but it looks huge from the outside. So uh, when you have different partnerships, it's... Um, it's much more difficult to, uh, you know, basically fool people around you. So you kind of have to uh, keep it real and you have to be honest on what you're planning to uh, implement. Uh, so I think those are uh, some of the uh, main keys to, uh, uh, you know, multilateralism versus um, hegemony. That's a uh, dear Yulia, just to remind our viewers that this is Views on the Continent 
on uh, the Pan-African Television Africa Media. In today's world, we talk multilateralism. In today's world, we talk globalization. In today's world, we talk, uh, of course, international relations that have taken a different perspective and, of course, uh, bringing us to our topic this day, how multilateralism can be a solution uh, to a world that has been dominated over the years uh, by the U.S.-led Western hegemony. We continue to bring uh, this discursive analysis uh, into our topic for discussion, uh, dear and not. You know, pundits or some pundits have highlighted multilateralism to be that strong force or catalyst that can uh, neutralize this Western uh, domination or hegemony. But there are, we still have some people like they are very pessimistic uh, that uh, uh, multilateralism is merely an uh, uh, idealistic concept and that uh, Western powers are unlikely to relinquish uh, their advantageous positions uh, voluntarily. So now the question is how do you respond to this uh, skepticism amidst uh, the, 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 the global happenings? Well, I would answer that uh, to those people that uh, the United States for a long time uh, relied on its uh, soft power and it enticed an irration around the world owing to uh, devices such as its uh, 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 culture uh, uh, and its cinema and its uh, uh, the American dream. That's the way they called it. Uh, but one uh, has to understand that from the moment uh, you cease to be a power attraction to the rest of the world and that the only thing that is left is the naked aggressions uh, which sustain this uh, uh, illusion. Uh, you lose all your power. It's almost like uh, the emperor has no clothes. And this is what we're seeing now, uh, increasingly so, because every action that the West seems to be under their current political leadership anyway, is attempting to implement, to delay uh, their uh, collapse, I guess. They're uh, losing grip on the levers of hegemony. Uh, the exact uh, opposite uh, happens. And so it's interesting in that sense to see how uh, all this is essentially self-inflicted. Uh, the more uh, they try to get out of the swamp in a way, the more they get sucked in into the swamp. Uh, and this basically uh, uh, is predicated on the notion that there needs to be an introspection in order for the, the uh, curative, uh, the uh, treatment to be effective. And we are right now in denial at the level of the political elites in the, uh, in the West and in the U.S. Uh, it might not have uh, escaped our listeners that uh, as we speak right now, the U.S. Uh, and its Western allies are gearing up to uh, set up a permanent headquarters for NATO in Mauritania. Obviously, uh, this is not very conducive to multilateralism uh, as a as a concept, since NATO, uh, lest we recall, is a military organization. But the fact is, uh, they are not uh, showing any sign of engaging uh, in uh, as equal partners with African countries. Their goal, their aim, is to uh, pursue the same policies that got us where we are now and double down on them. So we can expect uh, more of the same, yes, but this is only sustainable in thus far as everybody else playing along. And as Julia Berger mentioned it, uh, people now around the world, uh, other countries are turning their back on the Western models. Uh, it's almost like the uh, spell has wore off. And uh, you know, uh, if uh, the West loses that uh, uh, this sense of uh, hypnosis that it has, uh, this sense of uh, projecting fear, because it is, make no mistake about it, intimidation and not convincing through civilizational uh, argument. Uh, you know, nobody wants to, uh, nobody feels attracted to the West as it looks these days anymore. And so if the West is not able to attract anybody else around the world 
to what they are supposed to represent, then everything is it's over. And militarily speaking, there's only that much that the West can do because it will find on its uh, path uh, rival poles of uh, powers who are themselves perfectly, militarily speaking, equipped to face off with them. And, and we see it actually even now with the uh, uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, they thought that uh, for the last eight years, some would say even further than that, looking back, uh, everything was uh, set up to basically inflict a military defeat on Russia. And despite the billions upon billions of dollars, the uh, diplomatic cover extended to the uh, proxy uh, 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 regime in Kiev, uh, the uh, flow of arms being shipped uh, into that, uh, formerly, that, that country formerly known as Ukraine, we realized that uh, you know, Russia is perfectly ready and uh, you know, uh, able to handle any kind of challenges. So they are in panic right now. And uh, instead of, uh, again, practicing this introspection and changing you know, uh, entirely you know, their perception of the world, not as much as uh, first among equal, but uh, uh, you know, at least try to notch it down and try to acknowledge the reality that uh, the West it does not have the means to maintain its hegemony anymore. Uh, things will unfortunately uh, likely uh, uh, remain uh, the same in terms of the Western approach to uh, engaging with the rest of the world. But again, a reality will catch up with them because more and more uh, countries are feeling confident. They are banding together. In Africa, Pan-Africanism Pan is the key to uh, escape this uh, Western uh, 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 attempt to uh, uh, influence on the uh, countries of the continent's destiny. And, uh, you know, confidence and uh, belief in oneself uh, is only halfway, uh, but it's an indispensable step. And uh, Africa now has, has taken control of its destiny and it's a process which cannot be stopped. Uh, it's a process uh, that uh, cannot uh, be stopped. On a uh, feel uh, the uh, set goal is achieved. Uh, we are going to continue in the same uh, light. Uh, let's, since you mentioned uh, Africa, dear uh, Arno, uh, Arno, let's now continue with Yulia. Still bringing in uh, the African uh, perspective, we are talking about uh, the wind of change that is blowing, of course, shifting from Western hegemony uh, to uh, the embracing uh, multilateral Multiculturalism, you know, uh, you, uh, some pundits, of course, across Africa, and uh, some uh, intellectuals have actually said uh, that in the days uh, they thought uh, the, the Western sanctions or economic sanctions, to be precise, on nations, especially uh, a country like uh, Zimbabwe that has suffered economic sanctions from the United States, from the European Union, and we can name uh, the rest, uh, has actually uh, uh, suffered a lot. And we can see that when sanctions are being imposed on a nation, the citizens, of course, will suffer the consequences. So there is this school of thought that has said it is time uh, for the, a change of perspective uh, where we need uh, uh, a collective uh, uh, intellectuals and academia from across Africa that can outrightly uh, talk about uh, the uh, this new world order that can uh, actually uh, bring their voices to, to the illegalities of Western system of, of course, uh, uh, talk about these economic sanctions because back in the days, they thought uh, that these sanctions actually were legit before actually understanding uh, some aspect of the UN Charter uh, that they actually came to the realization uh, that the Western hegemony was actually uh, a plur uh, by uh, a single power uh, to control the, uh, the, especially the economy of the world. So in this perspective, uh, uh, dear Yulia, what do you think uh, 
African intellectuals or even intellectuals at uh, the global arena and academia can do to educate people to become conversant of uh, the, uh, the, the, the effect, especially the negative effect of a system like uh, uh, this uh, unipolar world uh, system, uh, especially the financial system. Uh, we know that in the days, Africa has actually been sidelined from financial markets, and I think that is still the, the case in uh, the global society. So with all of these changes that are happening across the globe, what analysis can you advance towards uh, the, the role uh, that this uh, academia or uh, intellectuals can do to be able to bring out the voices and educate people on uh, the right philosophies because we know uh, the, the, the perpetrators are actually very powerful that they can neutralize any attempt to change perspective uh, surrounding uh, their uh, system which has not worked for the world but actually to position them well as far as control is concerned in the global world. Thank you for this uh, question, dear Clarice. I think it's a very um, important one, and I want to answer it by giving uh, several uh, several points uh, that would reflect the, uh, uh, the the thoughts that I have um, on the topic. Uh, so, um, point number one is that um, you don't even have to be an intellectual to uh, distinguish between what's right and what's wrong because you always have uh, the uh, resonance uh, of truth uh, somewhere around your heart area, right? And when someone is trying to tell you that it's a fair and just system when you know, one group of people has to be uh, you know, suffering so that another group of people could be uh, enjoying their uh, golden billion life, I think you don't have to be an intellectual to understand that something's wrong with this, right? When you see a continent of Africa, for instance, the richest one uh, on this planet in terms of, uh, you know, um, resources, in terms of uh, its potential, in terms of its, uh, you know, um, human capital, and in terms of many other things, in terms of its potential in agriculture, in mineral resources, in creativity, in, uh, you know, just um, uh, such a vivid and vibrant continent that it, that is being so much suppressed. Uh, you don't have to be an intellectual to understand that something's wrong with the system in which uh, the continent exists if it has to sell uh, its uh, raw materials and resources and its, uh, you know, labor for such a low price. So, uh, um, uh, yes, I, I think that uh, some of the sophistications uh, that are being promoted are, um, you know, promoted in uh, such a way in order to uh, manipulate uh, the people and manipulate the public into thinking that it's a normal system when uh, some, you know, uh, like a limited group uh, has the uh, moral to do anything they want and everyone else has to, you know, be obedient and uh, be okay with that. That's point one. Point two, I'm expecting, um, and this is just the feeling I have after having, you know, traveled across Africa and after having communicated with people that Turkey is about to go through a wave of, uh, uh, you know, this movement for real sovereignty and independence, because it's just formal. I mean, it's hard to deny the fact that uh, most of the African countries are still being controlled from the outside in terms of their political and economic life. So uh, this is no uh, secret to anyone, I believe. Uh, point three over here is that um, I believe that the pandemic has played a huge role in, in this process of, uh, you know, many uh, people, not just, uh, let's say, philosophers and not just like public activists or the ones who analyze the news a lot, but also in terms of just, um, you know, regular people in the street, let's say, that started realizing that something's terribly wrong with the system because when the pandemic lockdowns and regulations and everything related to the vaccination was being imposed on African countries that didn't even have too many COVID cases, uh, while some other, you know, diseases, illnesses, and issues are much more topical on the continent. When you had the lockdowns being implemented with the brutal force of the police and of the army, uh, you could easily tell that something's wrong here and that uh, probably that kind of decisions were brought down uh, to African countries by somebody else who could uh, control the decision-making process and implement such harsh policies without no uh, valid reason. Because if you look at the stats, 
you will see that it was definitely not necessary. And when you look at the stats of the negative effects that those lockdowns had, especially on the population who is hardly making their ends meet, and for them staying at home was critical uh, because they couldn't go out and make their money and make their living and, you know, come back home with the, the food their families need, right? So that was... Uh, yeah, that was much worse uh, and that had much more of negative effects than it did in uh, Europe, for instance, that has also suffered uh, uh, has also suffered from uh, the lockdowns in terms of people losing their jobs, readapting, going through mental uh, disease um, issues and disorders and this kind of things. So what I'm expecting now, and that would be uh, point number three, is a new wave of this uh, movement for sovereignty and independence, and it's clear that it's happening. And luckily, uh, Africa and African communities are represented by a lot of beautiful people who dare to speak out, because um, this is essential, you know. Uh, unfortunately, not just the Africans, but many people across the globe had to just sit there silently uh, and, you know, to keep their opinion to themselves. But now I think we're reaching this uh, critical point when speaking up would be uh, taking place, uh, you know, more and more. And this is how a lot of those who were just uh, keeping those discussions uh, behind the closed doors would be able to understand that the truth is obvious for many people out there and that it is possible to say that the king is naked because that's exactly uh, you know, the case uh, in terms of the uh, fake system, we tend to um, obey to collectively, not just in Africa, but, you know, across the uh, globe and within the Western community itself that is still trying to act like nothing's happening and that the value system, uh, value systems that they're trying to impose on everyone else uh, are, you know, okay, which is not really the case because if, if uh, you know, the value system is targeted at... Uh, um, killing the life, uh, it goes against the laws of nature under which, uh, you know, our communities were being created. Thank you for that, uh, dear Yulia. And uh, we're going to continue the uh, uh, discuss with you, Mr. Uh, Arnold Devley, uh, still on the aspect uh, of uh, having a say, you know, uh, the uh, uh, statistics have shown uh, that developing countries often struggle uh, to have their voices heard in uh, the uh, international arena, especially on issues uh, that actually have a global, uh, global impact on, of course, which penetrate Western dominance. So now, since today, our focus is on the role of multilateralism in bringing a solution to Western hegemony, how can multilateral forums empower these uh, uh, developing countries and ensure their active participation in shaping global policies? Dear Anand. Well, I think we can uh, have as many fora as can be. Nothing is going to change for uh, as long as the current uh, slate of international organizations, and by that I mean the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, are essentially controlled by Western powers. Uh, this is something that cannot be uh, viable. And so what we are seeing increasingly is what we recently witnessed uh, during the uh, pact for a new uh, uh, financial order, uh, where Emmanuel Macron was uh, somewhat trying to uh, maintain the illusion that uh, it's business as usual. And we were hearing interesting uh, intervention from some of the African head of states there in the uh, representative of Kenya, who said, but how can we actually uh, re-found anything, realign, reset any kind of uh, a financial uh, order in this world uh, in thus far as uh, keeping with what's been going on the last, who knows, 50, 60 years, uh, i.e. Western powers control the financial mechanism. It is not going to work. And I would say that this institutional uh, disconnect between uh, the great uh, declarations and the uh, noble statements uh, and and uh, what you know this what what we have as, as 
available mechanism uh, has to be addressed in a larger context. Uh, we're dealing with a disconnect between uh, what's being said and what uh, and how the world is actually currently configured, not only in terms of finances, but also in terms of uh, development, in terms of uh, international uh, legal institution, as we've seen recently, again, with the uh, controversy surrounding the uh, ICC delivering warrants uh, alongside the lines of uh, political uh, uh, goals as opposed to applying international law across the board, notwithstanding whether the suspect uh, is a Western leader uh, or an African leader. Uh, and uh, I think this is also the problem that we have with the G7, uh, formerly also the uh, World Economic uh, 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 what do you mean? Uh, the uh, World Economic Forum, which is also more of like a Western-centric uh, uh, organization, uh, we need to take this into account. And um, around organization, emerging organizations such as BRICS, uh, it has to be ingrained more and more that unless a genuine, honest, candid accounting of the situation as it is is obtained from the Western uh, countries and concrete steps are taken into uh, account and implemented to uh, provide a re-equilibration of this, I think uh, the BRICS would be only the beginning of a uh, exodus where we will increasingly see uh, emerging organizations, emerging international tribunals, emerging maybe uh, organizations which one day might compete with the UN because the UN let's call it you know let's let's be honest has been uh, uh, powerless to prevent a lot of the crisis that we are going through right now uh, it is depending for its functioning on uh, a lot of Western monies the World uh, Health Organization Julia was mentioning it uh, in her intervention uh, is at 90% financed by people like Bill Gates and the Gavi Alliance. So I'm just pointing out that, you know, there's, there's the discourse that we hear and there are the, there's the cold reality of a current mechanism being completely controlled by Western powers. And so in order to uh, uh, somewhat bring some kind of realistic uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, creating multilateralism, there needs to be talks about uh, what to do once, you know, we realize that those who control those mechanisms do not want to relinquish them. Uh, and if it requires building parallel institutions, uh, then that might be the way to go. And the globalization, I think in that sense, uh, was always a a mirage and uh, you know multi uh, polarity uh, will somewhat uh, fill the vacuum left by this uh, uh, illusion uh, that has been peddled by the West for the last 30 years. Uh, you make mentioned uh, about uh, the BRICS, and uh, when we talk about Western hegemony, we are looking at how we can bring a solution uh, to this. Uh, and of course, do you think BRICS uh, can create an alternative uh, payment uh, uh, system? Uh, dear, uh, let me let me of course uh, present uh, this question to Yulia. Uh, looking at uh, the role of the BRICS in bringing or creating an alternative payment system and how feasible well, will this be in uh, salvaging the financial trouble especially here yeah, of uh, African states because where we know like we already highlighted Africa seems to be uh, actually uh, sidelined from the financial market and uh, when uh, uh, some of the financial global financial decisions and we actually see the consequences on the economic recovery of countries across Africa. So where does BRICS stand to salvage uh, this and bring forth a strong alternative uh, financial system to counteract, of course, uh, that which is led by the uh, uh, US-led uh, uh, Western hegemony or dominance? Yulia? 
to um, apologize because I just realized that I have not uh, given you a proper answer to the previous question. Your previous question was very practical and you were asking what exactly can be done. And I uh, um, uh, didn't mention, uh, you know, some of the practicalities. So please let me start from that and uh, finish off that thought. So uh, I believe that uh, the key is speaking up and that was the conclusion I didn't make. And uh, there are so many people out there uh, talking about uh, issues and trying to implement a different kind of uh, projects um, that would be focused uh, on the benefit of their local communities and uh, of the global community. So one of such projects was uh, Globus project that we founded one and a half years ago when it became clear that uh, the transformation we're undergoing altogether uh, will be a major shape up to all of the systems and a major stress to all of the systems, uh, you know, uh, at the global level, starting from geopolitical uh, systems and institutions uh, down to trade and finance and everything else. So now, one and a half years after, after we've had several rounds of talks and after we've had several applied projects implemented together with uh, experts, um, it has become even more clear that uh, any practical steps require to have some material uh, basis, right? So uh, when we talk about establishing some new types of relationships, uh, there has to be the uh, material which is economic and trade uh, ingredient to that. And you cannot uh, trade, uh, and you cannot, uh, you know, work on any kind of infrastructural pro projects, etc., when the financial system and the uh, economic system is being monopolized by someone. And that's exactly what Arno was just talking about. You know, the way the uh, IMF functions, the way they make the decisions, and the way they, uh, you know, make the decisions in order to either. Uh, support the ones that are loyal to them or punish uh, the ones that are not, right? So uh, I think that when we talk about BRICS, uh, this would be a very interesting um, alternative because BRICS is not even an institution. Basically, you know, what BRICS is at the moment, it's a uh, gathering of, uh, uh, it's a regular gathering of uh, heads of states uh, and it's a contact group uh, of Sherpas or, you know, ministers of foreign affairs and other relevant uh, civil servants. But those are contact groups uh, and those are, you know, discussion venues. So it's not of an institution. And uh, this fact makes it much more flexible uh, on the one hand. But I think that introducing some kind of bureaucracy is inevitable because this is how, uh, you know, the life cycle of any organization goes. But BRICS is also a very open format because uh, you know, BRICS is one thing, but in, in reality, it has been functioning in this BRICS plus uh, format. And this plus implies pretty much any country, uh, you know, on this uh, planet. We also see that BRICS has a completely different model because uh, at the same time, like parallel to uh, those, uh, you know, official contact groups and the uh, communication that happens between the heads of states and the ministers of relevant uh, ministries, uh, uh, we see that there are a lot of uh, NGOs and a lot of uh, grassroots initiatives that take up the name of BRICS. And here again, it has to go through a certain culture because among this crowd, you also see some of the uh, quite fraudulent, uh, 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 you know, moves and activities uh, made by uh, some people. But still, you know, this will be filtered because what is not, uh, um, you know, what is not capable of... Uh, of bringing some actual value would be um, dying off and, uh, you know, just would be filtered out from this. But uh, BRICS at the moment is, again, a contact group. Uh, it doesn't have uh, its own bureaucracy. It's not regulated by some monopolized institution. And at the same time, it creates a, a venue for NGOs, for different kinds of expert groups and uh, different kinds of international activities to take place. And I think that is essential. And if there will be some material, uh, you know, component to that, which is working on specific projects, creating something together, using uh, own sovereignty and using own, uh, let's say, financial system or own um, investment uh, in order to uh, implement the project, we will see that something beautiful, you know, could grow out of this because uh, this would imply a much more balanced system where you have, uh, you know, the bottom up, uh, uh, path and where you have this uh, more balanced uh, system of relationships where actors are free to choose 
what is beneficial for them and you know what matches their goals and interests best. Definitely, uh, Yulia, thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, go swiftly to you, uh, Mr. Arnold Dovley. We are aware of that uh, Western parts often leverage on uh, via, uh, maybe their economic uh, might to uh, assert control over the global narratives. But today we are looking at this uh, uh, new uh, philosophy, ideology of multilateralism. So how can, in your own perspective, how can multilateralism rebalance uh, this uh, disparity and provide a platform for diverse voices to be heard and uh, uh, respective? And we also know uh, that uh, this multilateralism requires effective mechanisms and, uh, and institutions to ensure its uh, success. So what analysis can you uh, uh, give to this uh, problematic? Well, it's interesting because I tend to uh, refer to a concept called multilateralism and isolationism. But isolationism in thus far as the West is concerned. So, in a way, it's almost like you will uh, somewhat ignore what the West does and what it says, knowing full well that it does not mean what it says, and you will build your own alternate uh institutions as julia mentioned uh emerging bureaucracy will obviously be uh, par for the course but ultimately you have to move on you have your own priorities you are uh, responsible for bettering uh, uh your the livelihood of the people that you uh, have been uh, uh, elected ideally speaking to uh, a minister and so in every country where this is the alpha and omega, that is a sovereign country that does not uh, consider its own people like a quantitative uh, uh, or variable, you know, in some kind of uh, supranational uh, operation, you know, meaning that the country is submerged into a larger uh, magma, uh, then you will see more and more, uh, and we see it now with. Uh, the BRICS situation is, to me, extremely telling because uh, we are seeing things that would have been unthinkable a mere couple of years ago. Uh, a country like Saudi Arabia is a very good case in point. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, a couple of years ago, was technically being weaponized against Iran in the region of West Asia. And everybody was... Um, convinced more than ever before that uh, the kingdom was Washington, uh, an escapable eye in the region, that there was somewhat of a special relationship between Washington and Riyadh. And whatever happened in between, I, I would say something like the special military operation happened, uh, plus a slew of uh, arrogant statements from American uh, diplomats and uh, the fact that uh, a lot of countries are getting extremely uh, going leery and weary of American uh, admonishment to uh, do this, don't do that, uh, act, uh, you know, respect the human rights when the United States obviously violates them all the time. This kind of discourse has really gotten to uh, not only annoy but exasperate uh, a lot of countries. And so, uh, in the wake of the uh, event of uh, February 24th, 2022, uh, everything somehow just on, came to the fore. It, it existed before underneath the uh, surface, but it just all came out. And we saw suddenly uh, a rush of, uh, you know, we're talking about now what, 40 countries, you know, who have expressed their desire to basically turn their back from uh, the G7. Uh, and embrace the BRICS model. Uh, this only shows that multilateralism will happen. It's a necessity. It's existential for those countries. But it will be coupled with a somewhat of a cordon sanitaire uh, with the West. Since the West does not want to even begin in its wording of, 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 of the reality around it, 
to take into account that uh, the rest of the world is tired of to kowtow to their admonishment and uh, and ukas, uh, we will witness uh, a kind of a polite, uh, you know, isolation movement uh, where the world uh, will basically move on and attend its own business, attend its own affairs. Uh, it might uh, be done initially in existing institutions, but as time goes on, uh, new institutions are bound to emerge, which if the West does not, uh, you know, practice this introspection that I was referring to uh, at the top of the show, uh, they will be left in the wilderness. Uh, it's their choice, but uh, nobody wants to play anymore. And so uh, the last country as the last guest will basically leave the ballroom, uh, maybe not even turn the light off until the West realizes that it's basically uh, dancing on the table when there's no one in attendance that's basically what seems to be uh, going on right now and and the west is increasingly looking uh isolated uh, fearful uh hysterical and those uh, uh, hysterical antics to me betray this very real sense at some level in the west that uh you know no one is uh, willing to play along anymore and so uh, multilateralism, yes, but uh, it has to be accompanied with this willingness to uh, basically uh, break away from uh, Western discourse, if not Western institutions. Uh, talking about uh, organizations uh, you highlighted in your analysis, uh, I will stay with you with uh, this question. Uh, now that we have seen, like you have underlined, uh, the importance of multilateralism and how it can go a long way uh, to solving this Western hegemony uh, that has been actually uh, brought to the fore due to the uh, happenings or events that have characterized uh, the global world in uh, recent uh, times. Uh, so in your own uh, perspective, aside uh, BRICS that people have been mentioning, which existing global organizations can uh, play a pivotal or vital role in challenging this uh, Western hegemony and promoting uh, multilateral cooperation? You have actually uh, uh, highlighted the lapses of the United Nations as well. So in your own perspective, are there other existing global organizations or can organize if they do not exist already uh, what can be done what mechanisms can be used so to bring forth uh, the uh, global organizations uh, that can actually uh, counteract uh, uh, this uh, uh, play uh, that is ongoing in the global world where we see uh, the world uh, doesn't quote uh, being uh, uh, trapped in a web uh, uh, coined by the uh, uh, u.s led dominance and allies Well, I think one good uh, precedent as an example would be uh, what happened with the uh, European Union going back to 1957, when it was just a mere six countries deciding to uh, trade uh, steel uh, among themselves. And, and that point on, it uh, grew uh, from an economic uh, uh, collective into a political structure. And there's no reason to assume that what goes on with BRICS and now BRICS plus will uh, follow the same trend. I also think that the uh, UN can play a role, but only as in as far as the General Assembly is concerned, uh, because it is there that uh, you know the overwhelming majority of uh, the world uh, uh, states and, and nations you know uh, can congregate and discuss. Uh, a range of issues and so i would not throw the uh baby with the water you know the proverbial uh, water of the bastard but uh you know we have to start somewhere uh, i believe the uh, general assembly has always had untapped potential uh if, and 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 in that respect uh, there's a lot of resolutions that reflect a lot of consensus among uh, nation states on again you know uh finding solutions to some of the world's problems. So 
this could be a, a, a ramp, a launching a, a pad for, you know, uh, the emerging of new institutions. But I fundamentally think that uh, not unlike, again, what happened in Europe in the uh, late 1950s, uh, new political institutions uh, with global reach, let's call it, you know, let's put it this way, if anything, as opposed to saying outright global uh, uh, institutions, but uh, emerging uh, centers of, of power built on multilateralism, owing to a, a, a pooling of resources, people and services and technology, will over time uh, develop, you know, some uh, some political structures, which at some point, uh, you know, will will maybe come to rival the UN, uh, if the UN is not willing to undergo the reforms that everyone uh, has been asking for. And the, the UN right now, like I say, is a very uh, sick organization. It's like a uh, uh, an invalid person who somehow, you know, uh, is trying to uh, hang on for for, for you know everything that it can but it, it, it sh has shown itself to be uh, limited in what it can do and what it can prevent and uh, you know it has no vocation to be just a debating society if it's not meant to prevent crisis and to resolve a crisis uh, as it was supposed to be doing when the charter was first adopted then it will become irrelevant it's adapt reform uh, embrace the new geopolitical reality or disappear. It's as simple as this. Thank you so much, uh, uh, dear Arnold. Let me come to you uh, with this question, uh, Julia Burke. You know, uh, with uh, the uh, dominance of uh, the uh, uh, Western hegemony, and of course, uh, you know, uh, multilateralism, we can see uh, the advent of multilateralism came to, to expose uh, the uh, uh, negative effect of uh, this uh, Western dominance. And of course, we, we can attest uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the geopolitical crisis or game which has been occurring uh, in the, the global world, especially as far as the African continent is concerned. And we see uh, that uh, the, 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 the U.S feel like her position has been attacked. And, and that's why we see today there is this war of information and there is this war of people wanting to implant their ideologies and, of course, uh, continue to be in control. But then uh, with uh, this wind of change uh, that is blowing and, of course, shifting uh, from the Western dominance to a world that is more uh, open for people to actually uh, make decisions on uh, their uh, cooperation partners to make decisions on inter international politics. We want to come again to to talk about uh, uh, the, 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 the upcoming Russia-Africa uh, summit and, of course, looking at uh, the, the controversies, uh, dear Eurelia, that have been surrounding uh, this event, even as it is yet to hold. We know th the first summit came and, of course, it, 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 it came and passed successfully with economic part deals signed between uh, uh, Russia and uh, countries across Africa. And we see the second coming in perspective, in, in the same perspective, but this time around meeting much resistance. So how can we use uh, this aspect of multilateralism to continue to open uh, the minds and the eyes of people? Sometimes the eyes are open, but we are actually blind to see the realities on the ground and see how we can educate people toward uh, choosing partners that will uh, actually give priority to their own uh, internal problems and, and internal solutions. And of course, how can the narratives be changed regarding what has been happening, the misinformation regarding the, the, the Russia-Africa ties, and uh, you can name the rest. Well, you see, um, such events as summits, uh, to a certain extent, are um, aimed just to uh, just to create uh, communication uh, venues, right? So uh, it's more or less uh, like a talk show where the key guidelines are being presented and the key, uh, you know, potential uh, cooperation areas are being uh, mentioned. So when you talk about Russia, Africa, 
uh, at the moment the trade balance between the countries of the continent um, and Russia is not as big as uh, it is uh, with the uh, main partners that you know both sides which is African countries and Russia uh, have so there is a lot to uh, get done and I think that the second summit uh, is just a, a build up to you know more specific projects and it's also important to keep it real right now because this year is not uh, definitely not the best one in terms of the uh, circumstances um, you know around uh, the continent and around uh, Russia let's say because at the moment and we are uh, less than a month away from the summit it's still not clear that uh, it's still not clear which uh, delegations would be representing which uh, you know countries of the continent but it is already clear that there has been a lot of pressure being put on um, you know the, uh, the the politicians from African countries that were recommended not to go and recommended not take an active uh, part uh, in um, you know um, working with Russia and we've seen uh, this and we've seen some of the issues uh, being discussed during the visit uh, of uh, uh, seven heads of African states to uh, Russia to St. Petersburg that took place in uh, June uh, this year. So there is a lot of pressure and we do not expect you know too much from this summit but it's essential to uh, have it happening to you know create those and promote those guidelines to establish communication to have a venue uh, that could be used for uh, you know both sides to know each other better because there has been a couple of decades when pretty much nothing was happening and even in simple issues like tourism and simple issues as cultural awareness uh, a lot of things are still uh, undisclosed for both parties if you come up to any African um, you know, and ask, what do you know about Russia? Well, aside for the name of the president and the, the, the famous images of him riding a bear or whatever else, you know, there wouldn't be too much. And the same uh, applies to, uh, you know, Russia at the moment. Not too many people have even visited countries of the continent, which is a great loss, I think, for them because uh, Africa has so much to offer, you know, for any, let's say, uh, taste and any uh, preference. Uh, it's you know it's uh, a world on its own um, and it's absolutely amazing i mean every time i travel to africa there is so much to discover and i also wish that people in russia would be more aware about that so that's one of the things that i have been trying to work on as well for several years uh, several years by now and i think that summit uh, fulfills this task as well of uh, you know uh, raising awareness uh, and uh, updating information uh, you know, on the uh, potential and on the, uh, you know, uh, perspectives, because uh, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of changes that have been taking place uh, uh, in Africa and in Russia as well. Russia has a lot to offer, uh, and so does Africa. So, uh, uh, but here again, you know, you need uh, maybe trilateral or, you know, multilateral partnerships in order to make really big uh, infrastructural, for instance, projects happen. And here you cannot... Uh, uh, you cannot uh, kind of avoid, and you shouldn't avoid uh, partnering also with uh, China, India, and uh, you know other ones. So, I think that uh, the summit would be opening up a lot of uh, opportunities for the ones will willing to see them and see them. Okay, uh, we we'll round off of this. Uh uh, program with you with this last uh, question dear Yulia uh, you know what in your perspective what concrete steps can be taken to promote a uh, genuine multilateralism that uh, encourages or encourages an equitable and inclusive global order uh, dismantling this western hegemony once and for all Uh, I, I think that uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, in common that we can observe, uh, you know, at the, uh, let's say, at the global politics level, at the community level, and at the uh, interpersonal level. So however trivial this might sound, uh, the only way is to start from our own selves, right? Because uh, if um, a person finds this kind of balance uh, within uh, him or herself and, uh, you know, within his, like, immediate uh, surroundings, with communities, uh, then um, it wouldn't be even an issue or even a question at the global level. And I see that some of the processes that were observed, um, you know, in many uh, different areas have similar 
uh, patterns to them, right? So uh, uh, I, I can hardly imagine a situation when um, a person would be advocating for, you know, like let's say a balanced uh, geopolitical system, but uh, you know would be still um, would be still okay with uh, I don't know things like domestic violence or you know I, I don't see like a person with the abuser patter patterns. Uh, uh, being an advocate for uh, multilateralism and, uh, you know, let's say fair partnerships and this kind of thing. So, however trivial, again, uh, this might sound, I think the only way is to start from our own self and to um, ask those uh, questions to our own selves, how we want to see, um, you know, our communities functioning. And uh, once you have it uh, kind of clear at your uh, personal level, it's easy to extrapolate or just to go, you know, uh, the other way around from understanding how uh, communities and uh, geopolitics could function uh, to, you know, taking it down to the personal level. But unless uh, all of it is um, synchronized, we would still be going through a lot of uh, suffering and a lot of uh, unnecessary, uh, you know, violence and unnecessary uh, victimization and all of the uh, other, you know, negative uh, scenarios. Much, uh, dear Yulia, and of course, I want also to extend appreciation uh, uh, to Mr. Arnold Devley, a political consultant, uh, for the uh, uh, great insight uh, uh, regarding our topic for discussion this day. Thank you for honoring this rendezvous, dear Arnold. Thank you very much for having me having you uh, dear uh, Arnold and of course thank you dear panelists unfortunately Mr. Elise couldn't join us for uh, some unforeseen circumstances but of course I want to thank you too for your insightful uh, responses to these uh, questions uh, pertaining our uh, topic for discussion uh, does the hoping of that of course uh, it's a discussion or a, a, a discursive uh, uh, program that will go a long way to change the perspective narratives across uh, the global world and of course bring about uh, clarity on uh, the potential of multilateralism i thank you all and of course uh, we want to appreciate in a special way the technical crew for ensuring uh, that this program was a success and of course uh, we started late because of some uh, technical lapses but at the end of course we were able to bring a solution to this i want to appreciate very much the technicians behind the cameras for a marvelous uh, work in ensuring that we continue to inform the world that we continue to educate the world and bring of course objective information that will bring of course good things especially across the continent africa thank you so much and don't go away keep having a lovely moment in the company of programs on africa media tv bye bye africa media